All right. So let's begin our second part about immersion. Huh, the background music. Interesting. The background music. Huh. I wonder why it is. Why is it that I went through? Why is it I went through and I, uh, I put background music on this? Hmm. Idea Dems. Because I like Blade Runner. There is also a Blade Runner RPG, everyone, just so you know. playing. What does this say? What does this convey? Why would I go through and put background music into this? Into the scenes? Even into the lobby? What does it mean? Let's take a second. Listen. So skipping through, right? There's reasons for this. There's reasons why it exists. And what do we call it? It's not just music, it's background music, right? Well, it's background music for a reason. What does background music do? Now, of course, uh, it was uh, brought up uh, because you like Blade Runner, to give your players uh, aural anxiety, uh, says Cy Neo. Background music helps to set the tone, says Coffee Cat. It can set the mood. Huh. You raise, uh, let's see. Uh, you raise she mononone. Monone. You raise she monone. Is that correct? Hopefully I got that correct. What's my fortune tonight? Everything will now come your way. Well, I hope so. That's cool.
I mean, Sanyo. That's part of it, too. <clears throat> because you can... You can get really involved. You can do your own foley. Right? That, that's just a crinkly, uh, a crinkly fortune cookie wrapper. You have pieces of paper that you can rip. Just like that. Did you see me rip that piece of paper? Wait, you didn't? Here, I'll get another piece of paper and rip it for you. Are you ready? There, you caught it that time, right? I totally ripped a piece of paper in half. What, what do you mean I didn't? You heard it. Do I have a fortune cookie dealer? Yes, Kroger. <laughs> you can use the voice modulator. You can use sound effects that you create. What could this be? This was just a, and did you hear me crunching as well? I mean, if not eating, I mean, people may not want to hear you eat. But if you take something crispy like a fortune cookie, or you can wear props. I wore now, not with the headphones, I wore this hat for a very important celebration in the D&D &D game. And I'll tell you, even though this hat is just made of some foam that I glued together and I drew on with a permanent marker, something as simple as this absolutely can help uh, immerse you and, and or your players. If you have, uh, well, you have a source of light. This is another way through the camera or in person that you can convey something that's going on. The tone of your voice, the sound of your voice, the intensity of the lighting, or the fact that maybe none of you have noticed that I haven't blinked yet. Why isn't he blinking? Why isn't he blinking? Uh, he's getting closer and he's still not blinking. What is this madness? He's so close now. Ah! I still haven't blinked. I swear I still haven't blinked. Okay, I might have. <clears throat> hey, Lethal Shadows, good to see you. One of the things I miss about in-person pen and paper RPGs is props, gesticulating, and jumping up to act things out. The game isn't the same. Yep, uh, I. Uh, those are things that I have always enjoyed doing. The gesticulation, and a lot of it has to be simulated through camera angles. You know, if you're playing through a, a web platform. But this is another way that you can get you yourself as the, as the GM, the game master, or as your players involved in what's happening. Is not just the words that you're saying and the descriptors, but what you are also bringing. Are you bringing some background music? Does it have to exactly match up what's happening? No. That's unreasonable. And if if you are uh, if you want to explain, um, here. You walk into the room. It is a mess. There's blood everywhere, and it's clear that there was a firefight. No sooner 
Do you step through the door then? You kick several spent shell casings on the floor. Now, do I have spent shell casings? No, I just have some old keys. You can have a lot of fun with some very basic lights, some very basic props to wear or to present. I, well, because Sai, I'd have to spend them. And if I'm spending them, that means that something's going on. And my, my house defense system has been activated. I would prefer not to have to activate my house defense system but I will if it's necessary. And then I would actually have some that I could rattle on, on microphone for you. <clears throat> but there's a lot that you all can do with just that little bit of creativity. The crinkle of a wrapper, the jingling of keys or some change. In fact, oh. Can I do this as an example? Do I have one? If I do, that would be awesome. I don't. Oh, curses. Coins, right? Have any of you have any of you ever had a Canadian quarter in your pocket when you uh, when you go to reach in and you you weren't consciously aware of having the Canadian quarter in your pocket but when you're fishing for some change in your pocket you stop for a moment and go that doesn't sound right now I I would have no way of telling you, what three pennies, a nickel, and a quarter sounds like. But there's a good chance I could tell you if I have a Canadian uh, quarter or I have some Canadian change in my pocket. Because it's it sounds slightly different, slightly off. We have, a lot of us, an instinctive recognition of things that maybe we can't actually describe. I, I, again, I could not tell you what specific change combinations sound like. Only that maybe there's a lot of change or a little change. Or I could probably tell you there's a coin in there that doesn't sound right. I don't know. I couldn't describe. I can't simulate a quarter with my voice. Like a quarter falling on pavement or something. But I could tell you the difference between a U.S. quarter and a Canadian quarter falling on pavement. <laughs> yeah, exactly, Sineo. You don't know what it sounds like, but you can tell what it doesn't sound like. You step into the castle. There's glitter and goblins everywhere. Music is playing faintly. You're either watching the Hero Zone or David Bowie is about to offer you his crystal balls. Yes, heretic. <laughs> and who wouldn't take up either either option, right? You're reminding me of the Money Python sketch where John Cleese's name uh, is the sound of a dropping pen. Uh, Sineo says, I've used wrappers for out-of-control fires. Oh, right, yeah. Get out of there! It's gonna collapse! It's on fire! That's the fortune cookie wrapper. There's dang papers everywhere. Hang on again. I, I just can't stop ripping paper all the time. It's the same when you're used to handing, handling money and you can notice when something feels or sounds different. Very different where you come across silver quarters, dimes, and nickels. Yep, exactly satirical. So again, a lot of things to play into. And where I opened up with things like background, background sounds. There's a concept that I want to introduce for immersion, 
And to do so, I uh, actually this is gonna put in uh, this is gonna put in some work in two different ways. What's on screen, everyone? What do you see? What's on screen? A page. Oh, a version of The Last Supper. Ah. Now, Sineo, I have absolutely nothing against you saying that there's a page on screen. But I want you to tell me something. Why didn't you tell me that there's two gray bars on the screen? Because there are. Do you not see the two gray bars? Because my computer adapted brain no longer sees UI elements as things. Ah, we're getting close. <laughs> if you all want, we can we can entitle this next part. Hey you, I want to take you to the gray bar. The gray bar. The gray bar. There is very much, in fact, two gray bars on this screen. Why why did no one bring that up? People, people see the page. Oh, negative space. What, what's, what are, what are the, what's the gray doing, Noctis? What's the gray doing here? <laughs> Heretic trance, would you expect nothing less? serves ah as the frame for the content cakes and pies cakes and pies there we go noctis silence in yep and satirical sage framing for the brighter more noticeable image uh-oh paschettios with meatballs i think you all are on to what i'm going to be talking about the next the next part of things the immersion. I want you to pay attention to the page. I want you to pay attention to the page. Even though, even though you have the entire page now, in your face. Can you see the page as you did before? Hmm. Maybe some of you did. Maybe some of you didn't. This isn't a 100% thing. Does that make the page a little bit easier to see? And if not see, does it make the page feel more presented? Maybe a little bit more clear. We have some very defined space. You know that there's no real data or even information out on the sides. In the gray. This might even help it more. Now, you may not be able to read it as clearly because it's getting smaller, 
But just looking at this, you go, okay, got it. I can tell you, this is a page describing the time of the red about the uh, the Ada Ada Corporation. And there's a and there is a picture that is a uh, a take on the Last Supper. Now, the page is completely in your face. Can you tell me that same stuff? I mean, it's there, but hang on. I uh, hang on. I, I, I got to scroll up. Oh, there's so much stuff here. Hold on. Wait, did, did I get lost? Uh, hold, hold on, everyone. Hold on. There, there's I, I'm trying to I'm trying to get to it. Hold on. I, I'm just looking for. No, I, I went too far. Oh, there we go. Well, now I can't see the whole thing because it's in my face. because it was in my face. Hi, Fluffy Sheep. <laughs> well, hey, thank you for hanging out for five minutes if you got it, Fluffy. If you wish to increase the immersion of your players, or even just tell a story, even even in an, uh, a complete narration in a novel, you all had had brought up framing. In this case, uh, I mean, we, we could use the concept of framing. I'm going to call these margins. I'm going to call these margins. It's important that there's always something extra. And look, I know all of you have it inside of you to be absolutely extra there's always that little bit more that's in the peripheral of your vision whether it's your mind's eye or it's your actual eyes I can see my finger so I'm looking directly at you and I can see my finger here and I can see my finger here so this is about my peripheral vision let me let me back up. I don't know if it's on screen. Let me look. Okay, yeah. But I'll tell you what, I'm looking at you and I can see the motion going on all the way out here. But I'm looking right here because you are my main focus. You are my audience. I'm trying to convey information, a story to you. But I'll tell you, in my periphery, in my margin, if a cat walked in, I could see their little tail bobbing as they come close, even though I'm looking at you. I could hear uh, if, uh, I don't know, there were police sirens uh, outside. I'm not paying attention to the street. I hear background music. I hear, you know, if you all have the alert box going off, I'm paying attention to you. But even though I am, there's still a world out there. There's a street that the police could uh, could blare down. There's a cat that could come over and start meowing or rubbing against my knee. There's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's winter time, so there's not, but there could be a little spider that comes down, okay? I'm looking at you and I can see a blinking light on one of my devices underneath my monitor off to the corner. <laughs> you can smell the ramen truck and the new cyberware, says Cyneo. All the most uh, interesting things happen on the edges of a crowd. The edge runners. Oh, whoa, says Dingo. Now, how does how does this become involved in storytelling? In storytelling, it is very important to have marginal space because this is what is going to help keep the focus of your players 
on what is happening. What is going on here? And this is this helps them immerse themselves in your world because there's there. Did you know that in this setting, there's other places than Night City? Yes, there's other things taking place in what used to be the United States, in what used to be North America and then the other continents. Did you know that Japan still exists for some reason? Oh, weird, but OK, I'll also spend disbelief. Let's have some fun with it, everyone. If everything takes place, if everything takes place in Night City, why would I, as your GM, tell you that Tokyo still exists and is a major world, uh, is a, a major world power? What in tarnations does Tokyo Japan have with the U.S. of A? Although it's not the U.S. of A anymore. What does Tokyo have to do with Night City if our entire story is taking place in Night City? Anyone? Bueller. 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 <laughs> well, because of Arasaka... But let's, I, I know that Arasaka is, is here. Let's pretend that we're not looking at Arasaka. Here, we're looking at Biotechnica. Why does, why does uh, La Joya, California have anything to do with Night City? Why do you why do you care? What why should you even be made faintly aware that there is a world outside of Night City? Because it's a thing your character knows and knowing more of what your character knows helps you to uh to inhabit their mind. In a sense, Sainio, yes. Economic trade and relations is satirical sage. Okay. That that does happen, right? This is the stuff that exists on the periphery. If you all are just, you all are playing a game of cyberpunk where you are just a, you're, you're a booster gang because why not? Don't you want to play cyberpunk as a booster gang as a bunch of execs and you live the corporate life? Don't you want to play cyberpunk as a, a squad of, of uh, lawmen? tracking down a, a, a someone uh, a, a suffering from cyberpsychosis and just keeps walking around through the city going stars why wouldn't you want to do that all the same even though we're just focused on one city in the setting to know that there are other possibilities that exist other places other people that is our margin that is our peripheral vision there's always something more there's that little bit extra there's that plus one even though you may never ever go to uh, uh, little Europe even though you may never ever go to little Europe, you know it's there. And you know that you could go there. And so the world in which you're adventuring feels a little bit more dynamic. You can understand there are other people out there that are living their lives and doing their thing beyond what is just happening around you. I I tried to convey this 
And I, I don't know if Fluffy's still around. Fluffy's a veteran of uh, the Chroma Company campaign. Uh, Coffee Cat might still be hanging around. I really tried to do this in the Chroma Company campaign that while the action almost entirely took place in one, one little region of the world, there was still a world. There were still people doing things in other places. And sometimes, you know, glimpses of those or a brief visit was uh, was there. But that despite the, the heavy focus of what was immediately happening in and around the party, there was always a greater world. Even though, really, a lot of the world outside of the region was never fully developed. But it wasn't like we all had to just pretend. You know, we all had to just suspend our disbelief. Because I hope that the immersion was there. There was this external empire that was totally not Canada looking to invade. There was a cosmic being, totally not of this world, looking to invade. There's a couple dwarves in the region. But where did they really come from? Like, we understand that they're there. Well, they must be out there living their lives and doing things. And then when you go and see them, there's yet another group of dwarves that you never get to meet. But they still do things that are different, and they're still out there. There's always that plus one, that little bit of extra, that margin, that is never clearly defined. It is very gray. It's blurry in your peripheral vision. But you know that if you need to, you can shift your focus because it exists. <laughs> ah, welcome, Raven. Uh, Sinio says, dude, you're articulating things that I've grokked for a while, but I've never been able to put into words, and I love you for it. Sinio, that's why we're here, and I'm, I'm glad this helps. So if you want to immerse your players, or even if you want to immerse yourself into the game and into the world, and in this case, we're talking about cyberpunk, if you're playing in Night City, you can incorporate all the sound effects and everything. That's fine. That's, that's the main. That's this stuff. If you want to keep the focus like look what's going on here everyone you see it happening live all the time what's going on here just look at this square this little bit of real estate what's happening hmm What's going on? I'm 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 the source of attention, right? I'm the focus. Why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> what do I have something on my face? Uh, let, let just do I have uh like I don't know is there a bug on me or something? What's uh? Hmm. All the same, I appreciate you making eye contact with me. I appreciate you looking at me. All right? I'm looking at you. <laughs> Winamp. It really kicks the llama's ass. Make sure that when you're telling your story, it's not always about what is obviously in front of you or in front of your party. That there's always that little that little gray margin, that little bit of extraness. That plus one. Because it can provide opportunity to explore to think outside the box, I can only think in my brain 
But you know what? I, I feel kind of comfy. This is a really comfy space. I don't quite feel as claustrophobic as this little box might have me be otherwise. So make sure that there's always a little bit of something extra that you're presenting. Because that is going to give more and better immersion to your players or for you as a character. Let's say that you, in fact, uh, Coffee Cat might still be here. Coffee Cat's character mechanically is a ripper doc. Coffee Cat's character started out as a nomad. And as a character, there is a whole other world outside of him in Night City, knowing that his family is somewhere out there beneath the buzzing signs. Someone imprisoned my family and I'm going to bust them out tonight. And whether or not we we have any interaction with a jail or Benji's family, we know that they're out there that we could bring that in, or just that it makes the place not so in your face. Man, I can read this, look at all the words, but I also can't see the bigger picture. I gotta back off some. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Am I making a lot of you feel old out there? Uh, Sineo. Uh, the handle, the handle of that person is, uh, there you go. How about that? So everyone out there, th this is your cyberpunk inspiration, okay? <laughs> also, I think I've just instantly aged people like 30 years. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yep. <laughs> yes. Good. Good. I just remembered I need to go drink my Metamucil. Yep. <laughs> yeah, well, look. <laughs> Velk Fruit, hello and welcome, thank you. So for your immersion, please make sure that there's always a bigger world out there. There's always something else a little bit more, a little bit extra, that you account for the framing. Because, and I'm sure for any of you who are into art, Many, if not all of you will say that the frame that is chosen to display the art is a piece of the art as well, or is a very important part of the display. Would the Mona Lisa hit the same if I went to Walmart for one of those, those cheap uh, like cardboard uh, acrylic, and then you have like the the black slider bars to hold to hold it squished between. Would the Mona Lisa hit the same that way? Or what if it was in a very elaborate, hand-carved, 300-year-old uh, frame that was made to accentuate the brush strokes? It could have even been made by someone uh, who wasn't the original artist. So please remember that. The frame 
is a very important piece of the art, even though it's not actively considered the art. You need the margin to help focus, to help bring a point in, uh, to, uh, to really drive home further what you want. We are having an amazing time. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, Velk? Is it Velk? Almost rhymes with milk. Uh, and what a cute doge that you have as well. <laughs> now, what is convenient about me using something like, uh, like this section of the book isn't just for the physical display and being able to help get you to super focus. Now, in this case, oh, there, there's way too much. The margins are bigger and you feel lost. This is this is unfortunately what can happen in a lot of sandbox style games. This is railroad. You can only look at the picture and you only get to advance as I advance you on the on the page. This is a problem that a lot of sandbox games have. Oh, I can see everything and a ton more. Well, I can see some, and I know there's a lot out there. You know what, though? This is this is just such a small part of the world. You know, I know this is here. I'll just come back to it. I want to go and see what's over here. And I then I want to go see what's over here. I, I can always come back to this. Hold on. I'm, I'm good. Hold on, Game Master. I want to go explore this whole Western world here. And then we'll pass through because I know it's there. And then I want to go explore this whole Eastern world over here. Oh, wow. We'll go Occidental, Oriental. We'll go uh, Austral and Aural. That's right. We're, we're breaking out the archaic terms, everyone. So you got to find what's just right. You want that... You want that plus one. You want that little bit of the periphery. That's the sweet spot. Uh, this is an amazing conversation, man. I want to give you some single malt scotch and see what wisdom tumbles out of you. Uh, Sineo, uh, while I haven't been drunk in a while, I'm going to be more along the lines of a philosophical drunk. Uh, and that... So you're probably going to get... Uh, a lot more very um, <laughs> blunt philosophy <laughs> from me if I was drunk. Uh, my name breaks down to Vale Elk Fruit. Uh, things I like along with my alias. Okay. I've only watched and listened for a bit, but it makes a lot of sense. Well then, Vale Elk Fruit and if I mess up your name, please, please let me know and I'll try and correct it. I'm glad that you've listened and I'm glad this is really resonating with you. Because I want all of you, it, well, this is cyberpunk, yes. You can bring this into D&D. You can bring this into Alien RPG. You can bring this into Kobolds Ate My Baby. You can bring this into All Flesh Must Be Eaten. Uh, you can bring this into whatever, whatever system you want or not even role playing with other people. Bring this concept into you writing that novel you've always wanted to write, okay? Now, we've discussed the importance of having the peripheral and the margin, so everything isn't in your face. Ah! Uh, ah! Uh, ah! Uh. And everything isn't so zoomed out. Well, I'm not interesting anymore. Look at all this cool stuff out here. This is a lot more animated than just, than this. Break it down, everyone. You can do it. Well, well, well. If it isn't Macabraid Derek himself, Scourge of the North, he is. Tell you what, what are you doing around these here parts?
By the way, I know it's macabre, Derek. If, if you're new here, it's a thing we do, okay? <laughs> Context! <laughs> Thank you for the shoutouts, Raven. Uh, just call you Vale. All right, so Vale, I will call you Vale. And if I forget to call you Vale, then please correct me again, and I won't be sore at you, I promise. So we are being raided by Macabre Derek. Uh, John Seer is uh, here and was not stuck. Uh, Derek, uh, Derek's bountiful raid is upon us. Uh, I miss All Flesh Must Be Eaten. The Buffy the Vampire Slayer RPG was based on it, and I love that game. Looking for a Ripper Doc worth their salt? Ah, uh, no Ripper Docs around here. I'm sorry to tell you, Derek. Unless. But no. Derek, I don't think you can handle him. He's in a little bit of grief. His family, well... Something happened. Now, the last part here of the immersion. Uh, Derek says, oh, man, I haven't played all flesh, but I really wish I would have back in its heyday. <laughs> well, so we man, how many old heads do we have in chat right now? <laughs> Am I just I, I, I'm, I'm going down the checklist of calling out all these. Uh... <laughs> Derek, real quick, let me see if you pick up on this. Uh, Derek, are you familiar with or have you played uh, Metal Gear 4? Metal, Metal Gear Solid 4? Why did the geckos moo? Also, Derek, that was 15 years ago. You're welcome, and you can turn it into dust at your convenience. <laughs> Welcome to you, 12-sided. I do. I, I distinctly remember uh, constantly recruiting party members, getting their stuff, selling it, abandoning them, and doing it all again, so I had a a greater uh, treasure trove at the beginning of the game. Because <laughs> I was a kid and morality didn't exist as a path in video games at that point in time. <laughs> Hi, Big Sam. Good to see you. Uh, John says, I remember playing MGS a bunch before, even though I'm quite young for normal people playing all these games. Uh, so as we're talking about the immersion, make sure that there's always some periphery, not too much, not too little. Keep some, keep some margin to keep your players invested in the setting, in the story and things that are continually moving. Now I use this as an example because I, there was this, uh, to show off. Um, but if you are going to play in a game of cyberpunk, do you need to have intimate knowledge of Arasaka, of Biotechnica, of Continental Brands, a treat to eat? You don't have to, but at least being aware of it, or even if, uh, let's say that you are running bread and butter Anti-corpo uh, cyberpunk. Hey, have a good night, GMV. Thank you for hanging out. Right, every this this is this is as straightforward as you can get. You are chromed up. You are on the streets of Night City, and your your plan is to take down 
the mega corp uh, of of everyone's you know object of hate. Now that might not even be our Asaka. Well, good, Thantos, you're catching on. Got another corpo to beat the corpo. Uh, uh, yes, and they still going. Uh, I'm not even 20, to be honest, but I was raised on those games, uh, not the newer games and such. Well, John, I... Uh, I'm glad you can at least still uh, identify with uh, a lot of the examples that I'm making here. <laughs> so if you as the game master are aware of Arasaka and generally not even do you, do you need to know that they're headquartered in Tokyo, Japan, especially if your game's never going to go there. Is it important that you know of Hanako Arasaka? Or that there's a million employees? No, not necessarily. Or even if you do, and you never really use it in, in your game, you can take little bits of knowledge like this and sprinkle it into your game to always have that margin. To go from this to this and make something that's otherwise very street level, claustrophobic, um, just, you know, crushing to give that little bit of precious breathing room and to allow the immersion because you might provide some kind of uh, street slang uh, or, I mean, not, well, I mean, you can just have street slang. Oh, hey. USMC Ninja. Thank you for the gift sub to Hans Half-Elven. Uh, and a, uh, a thank you and a, uh, a Semper Fi to you, sir. Thank you for the, uh, the creepy ghost noises as well. Now, by you having knowledge of Ara Ara means that even if they're the, not the main focus, if if they're gonna uh, if they're gonna play uh, Avalanche, right? You, you are actually running Final Fantasy VII in Cyberpunk, like I'm telling you, you can do. Then the game is you are gonna bring down Biotechnica. That's it. This is Shinra uh, from FF7. The entire focus is doing everything possible to bring down Biotechnica. And yet, I'll tell you... And yet, I'll tell you... Having a knowledge of Arasaka means that you could at least name drop. That you could have it come up in conversation with NPCs. As... A clue that comes up in a file found in Biotechnica, you know, when, when they hack the system to, you know, do all this other stuff. <laughs> it still allows you that little bit of breathing room, that margin, that framing, because, yes, other corporations exist. And that they're out there working, lurking, planning, doing no harm at all. Because maybe your version of Avalanche that you're running in uh, Cyberpunk is all is fine with Arasaka. Yeah, watching, waiting, commiserating. I mean, say it ain't so. I I will not go. But, I mean, just someone turn the lights on and carry me home. <laughs> so when you read about this, you read about the corporations who heads them. You may never really present it. Just like you may never present all the, the uh, street slang that you know. 
Which, by the way, if you all... Not everything, even in a, a grim, dark style setting, has to be, oh, so gritty. I'm wearing leather on, you know, and, uh, and sunglasses everywhere and trench coats. You can have some fun with it, too. It doesn't, ne it doesn't mean that uh, the game becomes a joke or that suddenly you're running a Noble Bright game instead of a grim, dark game. But sometimes coming up for a little bit of air like this can help, too. What's this, Corpo? Danger Gal? What the heck is a Danger Gal? Well, it's it's in Night City. Okay. It's in... It, it, the headquarters are in Night City, so that, that makes it a local. Okay. Regional offices, New York, Miami, Montreal, London, Rome, Zurich, Night City, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles, and Toronto. Oh, there is a Danger Gal up in uh, Canada. Oh, Ah, uh, thank you, Osaka-chi. Your ears were wiggling. Well, uh, not so much about Osaka. We were talking about Tokyo, and now we're over to uh, to cat girls who are uh, investigators, if I recall correctly, uh, as a detective agency. Run by Michiko Sanderson, 1,800 employees. As the Arasaka Corporation faced defeat at the hands of the U.S. military... It was forced to pull almost all its operations back to the core Zaibatsu in Japan. The loss of uh, the current operations chief, K. Arasaka, eldest son of the family-owned business, threw control of the vast security firm back into the hands of the family patriarch, the centurion Saburo Arasaka. Even at his advanced age, the elder Arasaka had not lost his ability to plan strategically or to inspire both loyalty and utter terror in his subordinates. But in America, Kay's only daughter, Michiko, faced her own dilemma. Her family company was now hated worldwide as one of the instigators of a terrible war, as well as having a reputation for mass murder based on the accusation that they had detonated a nuclear device in the center of a major American city. Michiko, a sheltered 17-year-old high schooler, had, of course, known very little of her elder family's world-spanning machinations, and her father had made certain to keep her away from the more unsavory side of the family business. With the Arasaka Corporation now persona non grata in the Americas, Michiko faced being deported to Japan, a distant nation that, as an American-born and raised teenager, was utterly whoop, alien to her. Michiko's solution was to lean heavily into her strengths. She was young, adorably cute, and possessed of a high IQ. She already had thousands of devoted young fans all over the world who were willing to take it as gospel that she said uh, that uh, she was an innocent caught up in her evil family misdeeds. She started by traveling to Washington, D.C. to meet with the president, Elizabeth Kress, to both apologize for her family's part in the war and to plead her case to remain an American citizen. It's not entirely known what Michiko and Kress discussed, but in the end, Michiko was allowed to remain in America to finish her high school career and then enter Stanford University, where she majored in, of all things, criminology. When she graduated three years later, she started her own business as a detective. Danger Gal is the name of Michiko's new company. On the surface, it is a private investigation firm specializes in, specializing in cases for celebrities and other socially important clients. As its perky, unstoppable head, Michiko is a staple of parties and events from New Hollywood to the hot spots of recovering Europe. Her visible naivete and an irrepressible charm disguise the fact that she's also a highly competent criminologist. It also obscures the fact that behind the scenes, she's fulfilling one of the directives she agreed to perform as part of her deal with Elizabeth Kress to remain on American soil locating and dismantling any Arasaka Corp operations in and around the United States. Now, did you need to know all that to play cyberpunk? No. Do you feel a little bit more immersed in the world knowing it? Eh, yeah, maybe. Will this ever come up in your cyberpunk game? Eh? Can you use it as a tool, directly or indirectly now? Yeah. 
Now, having taken a moment to listen to it, to read about it, this is a couple paragraphs discussing a an investigative firm. And you may never, ever, ever touch on this, this super secret part of the corporation, of the corp, right? In fact, you might just very well play a cyberpunk red game where all of you are detectives uh, working on behalf of the of the danger gal firm. And and you may never know or even run across Arasaka Corp operations in your entire story because you don't have to. But you could if you want or if in the margin you go, oh, that would be neat. Or it would investigating other people. You find a note that simply says, ara, ara. And you go, nani? And then suddenly, dun, dun, dun. The big reveal of the plot. And why it is that you, four, uh, four cyberpunk uh, cat girl detectives, are now hot on the trail for a, a corpo that uh, is supposed to not exist in the U.S. And yet here they are. I I should I, I should roll the R slightly, Dingo, because it, it, it's it's not like you know it's not like era era, you know it's not it's not like that it's ara ara. You almost need a slight roll, like one 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 trilled R, ara ara. Uh, Twelve sided guy says, "Fun fact: to get your uh, to get your PI license in BC, Canada, you have to work twenty five hundred hours under someone who already has their license, uh, like insurance investigation. Yeah, you can use it for a gig or gossip. Basically, the plot of the Danger Girl comic says Twelve sided guy. Yep, it's just it's one it's one quick. It, it's not a full. It, it's like you start the trill or you start the roll, but that's it." You, you know, everyone gets one. Ara. Uh, Sineo says, clearly this is a corp for e-girls. <laughs> well, look, I mean, hey, if they're going to upgrade you and you get like detective ears that will like track conversations uh, while you're walking around town or act as, you know, like a radio or something like that can provide illumination. Mm -hmm. Uh, hey, it's it's useful. It's form and function. <laughs> so, we didn't even explore. We, we didn't explore the big bad, like the biggest, the baddest, the evilest corp of of Arasaka. Arasaka. We went with arguably a Mimi. Uh, a Mimi Corp. And yet, with something like this, our understanding of the world grows a little bit, and we have a base of operations for a lot of fun adventures. And can you can actually get very, very immersed in what you want to tell as the game master or something that you can lean into as the player in the game. And then when you mix that, right? So let's say you are four. Uh, I, I'm I'm running a cyberpunk, by the way. I don't know if Fluffy's still here. Coffee Cat, I'm sorry. I hope this doesn't break your heart. But the four of you are not going to be uh, cat girl, uh, you know, uh, cat girl detectives in uh, Night City. But let's roll this together. You have background music playing for the mood. Everyone knows that there's something always more that's out there. You're running a game for four cyberpunk cat girls. You play with the light. You lean into the camera. You stand up at your table. When they're tuning their, their cat ears and they're hearing gossip, which means that you can use the street, the street language, or you do Foley to your microphone. Every little bit now, you describe the smell of something. 
And even if you want to do it in an anime style and be cartoonish, because you don't want the super grim, dark, uh, you know, stories from the streets of Night City. And so someone on your detective team smells ramen and almost just like floats over to the to the ramen stand. Mm, Oishi. Yeah. If you're having fun, you're telling the story, you're describing the sights, the smells, the sounds, the feel, the touch, the feel of cotton, the fabric of our lives. The vibe of the place. You have immersed yourself into this setting. And you have an amazingly fun game ahead of you in Cyberpunk. And you know what? We've gone through this and we have we have talked about immersion in the story, immersion in the world. We've not discussed the minutia of rules. I've not taught you how to fire a gun or stab someone or T-pose for dominance in combat. We haven't gone through crunchy bits of, of other things. And we haven't even taken a big dive into the lore, which you, you don't have to use any of it, right? Just use the crunchy bits and you make your own cyber uh, cyberpunk utopia or dystopia or something else in between. It could be a rural adventure. It could be a, a megapolis adventure, whatever. But hopefully now that we've, in our first night, we've discussed the, the broad setting and the feel of a cyberpunk game. Street level, claustrophobic. We've discussed uh, these these thematic, uh, these uh, human condition themes that you can't explore. And now we've, got, we've taken you in. We haven't just introduced you to the pool now, your, your toe, your ankle, maybe your shin, or even knee deep. Because I don't want you to get lost in the crunch. I don't even want you to get lost in the fluff. I just want you to get here and to consider the game. Because there are differences in running it against D&D. This is probably closer to being run like Vampire the Masquerade. If we're talking about, I guess, like bigger name titles. And I'm sure there's a slew of other of others that it would come close to as well. So this is more it, it would it's gonna feel a lot more like VTM than DD. You can explore a lot more, and you can have as much wacky anime fun or get super dark and dirty and dingy and cyberpunk if you'd like. But it is a different game. And I want you to make sure that you're prepared for it so you don't come into it going, well, I've played DD, I can play this too. I'm sure you can, but you might, if you play cyberpunk like D&D, &D, you might be having some difficulties or you might go, oh, this, this system just, I, I don't level up. I get IPs. Like we've been playing for three months and why am I not level seven yet or whatever? Like it just feels like all I did was was get a little bit better at, at shooting guns and and uh I don't know, uh hearing things. Well, because you're not the big damn hero going out into a grandiose world of uh, of high fantasy adventure like you tend to do in D&D. &D. It it's not a tending towards sanitized PG PG-13 adventure like a lot of of D&D &D, uh you know through the official sources anyway tends to be but if you accept that and you're willing to explore these themes and you're willing to approach the game in this different capacity you know still approach it give it a try but go into it knowing it is a different game that has a lot of similarities a lot of similarities but approach it with this in mind that the system built in and around and through it is to help tell these kinds of stories. You could still tell these kinds of stories through D&D &D and your own modifications to it or whatever. But this system 
will have you confronting a lot of different people, a lot of different concepts, societal or otherwise, fictional or non-fictional. And at the outset, you don't necessarily get to have that, oh, wow, you know, I, I, I know that I'm going to live because there's like five different spells to bring people back to life and a bunch of curative magic. And, uh, you know, there's druids and clerics everywhere and, and all this other stuff. This is you get shot and you you could just bleed out on the street and die right there. It, it can be a very deadly system. And while there's stuff that can help you not bleed out and to help you not die, it's not the same as just the bard being able to go, oh, and now you're cured. So the strategy to it is a little bit different. The approach to it is going to be different. And as such, you got to make sure if you want those fun, those fr uh, fun uh, brain juices squirting all through your, your noggin when you're playing, you got to understand that there, there are different achievements in this game than there is through a game like Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, Sineo says, by the way, Clan Toreador is best clan. Uh, the, everyone, so uh, Sineo is throwing down, is throwing down the uh, the glove and is uh, is calling for uh, Toriador. Uh, Big Sam says Clan Lasombra would like a word with you. Yeah, you'll tend to find uh, uh, social issues as well, uh, Dingo Panic. Uh, 12 sided says, as a Malkavian, I agree, and I'm sorry for your responsibility. <laughs> uh, if Derek were here, of course, he'd call for uh, Clan Ventru. Make it galactic and use the Battletech RPG. And also, hi, Orchid. It's good to see you. Uh, Heretic says, I heard Cat Boys in anime, and all I can think is Loveless now. Ah, very good. Uh, Josie and the Pussycats, or do they not solve crimes? Um, put that line in the dirt now, Maddie says Big Sam. Listen, if I don't have to pay for them and they have a filter for things like the electric hum of things, Catboy me up, baby. I want super hearing, says 12-sided. Dingo says, don't get me wrong, Maddie. I like it. It's just the meme. Imagine the corp as an anime woman saying, Ara. oh, absolutely. I, I, and I, I am not above having something like that, Dingo Panic. Uh, Sineo says, you know, this is the reason why when I do play d and I prefer Forgotten Realms. I've read so many novels and played so many games uh, that, yeah, you have the periphery. So you, pardon, you can always just throw it in to spice stuff up if you need to. Exactly. Yeah, wh what's your question, Sineo? The Tremere are pleased with the proclamation and will let you continue to believe that, says Noctis. Ah, there we go. Uh, Adventure Unite from Coffee Cat, uh, repping for Derek. Yeah, lots of advertising in Night City's innuendo infused. Yep. I mean, in a city where anything is anything and anyone can be anyone, you gotta cast a wide net. <laughs> a lot of people like going fishing with a bright light bobbing there, and th that'll draw the fish in. Big Sam says, well, we know what sells. Legos. Absolutely, Big Sam. Uh, I have to imagine that there are, there's a Lego store on like every every major street corner in all the different districts of, uh, of Night City. Donuts? I thought that's just what people bet against dollars. Mega blocks for life, says Big Sam. Sanyu says, I recently realized that narrative and cinematic systems are counterintuitively bad for immersion. Systems with more crunch ground the players with that crunch. Would you agree and have you been able to capture good immersion with one of these newer rule light narrative games? Sanyu, I personally do not like crunchy games. 
Uh, I'm currently playing in a uh, Pathfinder 2E game. I'm having fun with my friends. Do I like the system? Eh, not really. Uh, but where I'm, I'm having fun because it's a social activity. Um, I, I don't like crunch a lot. Now, I had a blast. In fact, I, I almost felt in 4th edition, I had a lot more freedom to tell stories because I just knew that the math worked. But the math wasn't too complex in 4th. It's just people were like, well, it's very linear. I, I get that as an argument. I don't like I, I don't like a lot of crunch. I don't want to have to consult a bunch of charts. I don't want to have to roll three different types of dice for everything. Uh, I I don't want a list of two hundred feats that I could possibly take for a character because I like focusing on the narrative and allowing my players to adapt what they have to what's being presented. Um. So I will offer, I, I, I want to offer a cinematic experience, but that is, that is based around what the players have brought to the table. And I mean, crunchy like GURPS necessarily, but in games like Fate, uh, uh, PBTA and Blades in the Dark, there just isn't enough to anchor the story to. Okay, so... Uh, so yeah, there are a, a, a lot of light, you know, very, very, very light mechanical games as well. Same direction. I I want some points of reference. I, I would like uh, there to be meaningful decisions, which is why I think like fifth edition D&D &D was f for, I know there's flaws. I think that hit a, a balance, a very good balance to me of crunch there's enough to make meaningful choices but a lot of margin room to make decisions or exemptions and that everything not everything was spelled out for you or there was a rule for everything i would greatly prefer that just like i i don't want a system that's like yeah just do whatever you want I'm like all right well then why am i playing your game i'll do whatever i want anyway you know <laughs> <clears throat> Yeah, I didn't ask how big the room is. I said I cast Fireball. Ingo Panic says, and a crunch one with lots of player interaction, thanks to the GM. Lego vending machine, says Grogren. Shadowrun 5 is too much crunch for you. Yep, so I, I like... By this stage in my personal journey through through this, through role playing and storytelling, I'm at the point where I have a lot of I have a lot of things from just my own life and education and experience that I can bring in, that I can supplement, that I can use to adapt situations. I've been around the block a couple times. I've paid attention in class a couple times. There's a lot of stuff I can bring into a game. So I don't need to be as reliant on a system to tell me what I can and can't do, unlike someone who might actually like that guidance because they don't have the life experience, they don't have the confidence or the education or I don't know, whatever else. And I'm not calling anyone out. I'm not picking on anyone. We're all at different stages of comfort and, and knowledge and everything else and play styles and everything. So I'm not picking on anyone. My way is not perfect for everyone. And heck, I even mess up my way sometimes too. Yeah, you know, I'm not even perfect in it. But, uh, you know, so I, something something like that, you know, even going through in Cyberpunk, it, it is going to be, uh, it, it offers a lot that can be modified on the fly, a lot that you can adjust on the fly. This is a very comfortable level of rules, uh, and uh, there's a ton of fluff. There, and, and, and in fact, this is just a rabbit hole that can go deeper and deeper. If you actually read more into it, you read the, the Cyberpunk 2020 stuff and all the, the other things. Um, so I'm not too worried about the fluff. The fluff will always be what I want to present it as. The crunch is just right. It offers good, firm decisions that mean something. 
It's not too spread out where everything is just a small hint of a degree different than something else. And uh, and you can you can build it, but it has that flexibility of, you know, I could I think I can do this with a skill. Can I try that? Rule of cool, absolutely. 